Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2019 Brain Health Online Summit. I am Amy Zellmer, founder of Faces of TBI, and I am a survivor from a fall on the ice in February of 2014. And myself, along with Dr. Jeremy Schmo, we saw a need in the brain injury community for more training and education on alternative healthcare methods and modalities for those who are still suffering from the lingering effects of a brain injury. So each week, during the summit, you're going to hear from presenters who will share either their experience living with a brain injury or working with brain injury patients. And so today I am here with Dr. Jeremy Schmo himself. And Dr. Schmo is the owner of Midwest Functional Neurology Center and co developer of the Brain Health Online Summit. Over the past decade, he has been studying and teaching functional neurology and he has treated thousands of patients with neurological disorders such as head injuries, vertigo, movement disorder, neurodegenerative, and developmental disorders. He specializes in working with post-concussion syndrome, which is his passion. He himself has suffered from lingering post-concussion symptoms after whiplash skiing concussions in 2007, 2009, and 2010. And that is the why behind his passion to help others. He has lectured nationally and internationally for the Carrick Institute of Clinical Neuroscience. He lives and practices in Minnesota with his wife, Erin, who is also a chiropractor. So welcome to the summit, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for having me. So, so yeah, glad to have you kicking it off this week with... Yeah, it's um, going to be a great summit. I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah. So today you're going to be talking about the neurological exam, and I'm, I'm really glad to have you talking about this because your neurological exam was way different than any neurological exam I had prior to finding you. Um, so I'm really excited to have you share and kind of just really break down what it is that you do and what you look for. Yeah, that sounds good. So I just wanted to start off with just kind of telling my why behind, you know, why, why do I do this stuff? Like, why do I help patients with traumatic brain injury? And why am I a chiropractor? And why did I specialize in functional neurology? So it's a, kind of a long story, but I've had multiple skiing whiplash concussions. One of them was in 2007. Another one was in 2009. It was about halfway during chiropractic school. And with that concussion in 2009, I didn't, I didn't even know it was a concussion at the time. I didn't really know much about concussion or traumatic brain injury. But what I noticed is that I started developing fatigue and just a subtle sensation that I was kind of rocking and rafting. And then I started losing weight. And I didn't realize I was losing weight. My friends were pointing it out to me, but I ended up during Cairo school probably losing probably 10 to 15 pounds. And that was in 2009. In 2010, I was skiing out in Portland and I fell and whiplashed my neck again. And that wasn't until about two weeks later that I noticed that when I went up an elevator and when I got off the elevator, I felt like my body slammed back into the ground and I, I almost fell over. I felt like my legs just went out from underneath me which was, you know, that was pretty terrifying. I had no, no idea what was going on. I was just hanging out at a seminar. So what I'm trying to get at is these symptoms, they kind of creep up on you. You don't know that it's going on when it's going on, especially if you have a brain injury. And if you don't know or you're not educated on what can happen with TBI, you might not even know that you had a, had a concussion. So after that 2010 concussion, I just started basically just going going downhill. I ended up driving back from Portland across country and when I got back I felt somewhat fine but I graduated and about two days later I felt like the whole room was spinning. I was like rocking and rolling and rafting and I felt like my body was in a perpetual state of movement and motion which led to anxiety and fatigue and more weight loss. And then that basically kept going for almost like a year, a year and a half before I asked for help. <laughs> so I was so excited about just starting my practice and getting into everything that I was just pushing through all the symptoms. I wasn't telling anybody. So 
key point, tell people <laughs> experiencing these <laughs> symptoms. Don't just try and push through it, try and get help. And I just kept pushing through and pushing through and I kept tanking and tanking and tanking more and more to the point where I had a hard time driving. I was dizzy all the time, fatigued all the time. And that wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, interesting story, I, I ended up adopting a dog <laughs> at that point in time. And his name is David, who also had a brain injury. So I was, I was walking through the park one day and I see this dog and he's, he's falling all over the place. So I walked up and I was like, hey, what's going on with this dog? And there they go, he had a traumatic brain injury at birth. We think that he had cerebellar hypoxia, so basically cerebral palsy, or he had cerebellar hypoplasia, where cerebellum wasn't developed as well as it should be. And I did a couple things, yeah, spun him around, did some head and eye things, and he started walking a little bit straighter. And these people at, at the, at the I think it was called Savable, we're like, oh my gosh, like, what did you do to this dog? This is amazing. You have to adopt David. <laughs> I was going on a trip to Washington State to visit my grandpa, and I get a call from them, and they're like, you have to adopt David. You're the only person that can help this dog. Mm -hmm. So I came back. I ended up adopting him, and at that point, I was, I was pretty messed up. So I was living at home with my parents, and working, I was still seeing patients. I was seeing patients maybe 10, 15 hours a week tops and chronic patients. So patients with chronic neurological symptoms. So I wasn't seeing a lot of people, but the conditions that were, they were presenting with were very complex. And I was living at home with my parents at that point in time because I started having trouble with my memory. Um, I had trouble just paying my bills, <laughs> which was crazy. And I was having trouble driving. So I was living there with my parents. I was rehabbing this dog, David, which I felt like rehabbing him actually activated my brain to the point where I realized I was that messed up. So I started getting into doing functional medicine and trying to heal myself nutritionally. So I was doing all these courses with different functional medicine companies and I started doing gut health repair protocols and doing supplements, nutrition, and doing lab work. And I felt like I was getting somewhat better, but I would always kind of tank. So underlying, I, I felt like there was this, this dysautonomia that was there that was perpetuating this dizziness. And it ended up that I had a central, central vestibular disorder. So my eyes actually had down beating nystagmus, so you would look at my eyes and they were subtly moving like this. I couldn't keep my eyes steady. And that's when I started doing, you know, functional neurology care with some local providers here. And I started getting better. I mean, my neck was tight as can be. I mean, this thing was like bamboo. I could barely even move it. And that was leading to deep pressure and headaches inside my head. So on top of it, I had a gut issue, an issue with my autonomics, an issue with my eye tracking, and an issue with my central vestibular sim uh, system. And all of that was leading to my cognitive decline and issues with my memory and ang severe anxiety, depression, and fatigue. So I kind of kept going and kept going, struggling with symptoms. I ended up going to a neurology symposium down in Arizona, and that's where I met my wife. So that's where I met Erin. And right off the bat, she realized that, you know, what the heck's going on with this guy? <laughs> you know, he, stuff isn't normal. Like, there, he's definitely experiencing these symptoms. I was telling her that, you know, about my symptoms that I was experiencing. And that's where it was time to really dive into the functional neurology care. And I ended up getting treated down at the Carrick Brain Centers doing, you know, gyro stim you know, different tongue stimulation, Dynavision D2. So I combined doing neurological rehabilitation. And then what I found is that I started breathing better, my fatigue levels got better, and my gut started improving. And then I looped back around and started doing all the nutritional and functional medicine care. And then it started to actually work. So that's something that I see with patients all the time is, they're doing nutrition and all the supplements in the book that people tell them that they need to take for their brain health, 
but underlying there's a functional neurological disorder. There, it's either a, like a neck trauma whiplash, there's a central visual based disorder, there's an issue with the vestibular system. And in my mind, you have to rehabilitate both of these systems. So people need neurological and metabolic and structure. And that's why we you know, really dig deep with our functional neurological exam, looking at all systems of the body. I call it the whole body approach to traumatic brain injury. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of break down you know, what we do with the neuro exam. I'll loop back in into my story here a little bit because I didn't just get better in five days. <laughs> you know, I did intensive care, but it still took three, four years, to be honest, for me to really start to get close to 90%. And right now, I mean, it's 2019, and I would say right now I'm probably at 90 to 95% of where I was before and I still have my ups and downs, and I know my triggers, I know what can push my system and lead me to go back, and I know that I have to keep my diet healthy, I have to take my supplements and nutrition, I do have to continue to do my eye exercises if I'm pushing myself with physical activity, so if I'm running, and if I'm going to the mall and getting a lot of visual motion, if I'm driving a lot, I still have to do my eye exercises here and there, but honestly, I only have to do them for five minutes, right? maybe three, four times a week, and I'm feeling really, really good. And currently right now, I'm still doing my neuro exercises. I'm doing diet and supplements and nutrition, and my whole game now is I'm trying to really get back into physical activity and physical exercise because I couldn't exercise for about five years. Mm -hmm. Because when I would, I couldn't sleep and I would develop you know, insomnia and I would lay there with racing thoughts and my brain was overstimulated and I would feel really, really dizzy and dysautonomic with tremors and anxiety anytime I would push myself with my head really bobbing up and down. So that's my story <laughs> and that's, you know, that's why I do this and why I'm so passionate about helping you know, patients with persistent post, not, not just post concussion, but, you know, dizziness and vertigo and, you know, balance issues and movement disorders, all of it. But really my passion is helping people with chronic post concussion symptoms because you're not ready to walk outside and slip and fall and hit your head on the ice. <laughs> you, know? Nope. You, you know, you're not ready to have a fall and I've fallen so many times skiing. You're not ready to have the next fall be the one that triggers this domino effect of your brain falling apart and have it go on for 10 years. So, so that's my passion. And I see people that have these issues. It's three years later, five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, and you can still help people. You can still make changes to their system. You can still build plasticity if you do a very detailed examination for that individual, find out what they need and tailor your rehab program specifically to their system, run labs, look at their underlying blood chemistry, see if there's any you know, underlying disorders that might be occurring, such as autoimmunity, you know, leaky gut, thyroid dysfunction, maybe their adrenals are just whacked out. Um, and on top of that, look at anxiety and depression and what might be going on with the frontal lobe and the autonomics, and you apply that all together, you bake that cake, you make it perfect, and that's where you're gonna get patients better that are, that are chronic. Mm -hmm. You know, and with me, I went to the neurologist, I mean, I knew right away I was not okay. Yeah. And I went to the neurologist, and you know, she did her exam, and she told me we just need to give it more time, come back in six months. Yeah. You know, so I kept going back every six months, and at I think it was like 15 months. She was like, well, you know, if you haven't seen any improvement yet, you're probably not going to. And I was like, what? Like I already knew about neuroplasticity. I just didn't yeah. know how to help myself. And, you know, unfortunately far too many people hear that from their neurologists that they can't get better. Um, so finding you and, you know, 
seeing results within two to three days, it was like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can get better. There is hope. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll go through what we do. So people are going to come in and they're going to have a binder usually of stuff, all these different tests that they've had done and all the different providers that they've seen. And guess what? We go through all that information. We look at everything. I look at all their past lab work. I look what, you know, what imaging has been done, what hasn't been done. We take all of that information into account when we're doing our history. I want to know if you had multiple head traumas, was there just one? Because if you've had multiple head traumas, there's a brain-based inflammatory response that is occurring. And these cells called microglial cells are probably activated and they're turned on and they're causing an inflammatory barrage in the brain. So right off the bat, if I hear that there's multiple injuries, we are gonna run labs and we are gonna look at things from a, from a functional medicine standpoint in addition to doing our very detailed neurological exam. Okay, so that's one point right off the bat. From our neurological, uh, neurological examination, number one, we wanna figure out what's going on with your autonomics. Do you know what I mean when I say autonomics? I do, but others yeah. might not. Okay, you have different systems such as the sympathetic and the parasympathetic which are intertwined and they integrate from the brainstem and they're all about fuel delivery and regulating hormones and blood flow and perfusion and doing all the automatic things that should just happen in your system, like getting blood flow up to your head and to your gut. All right, so that's very important because your nervous system needs oxygen, it needs fuel and nutrition and it needs activation for it to heal and build neuroplasticity which is getting neurons to communicate with other neurons and get them to integrate together and think about those neurons, take that, put it into an area of the brain, such as the cerebellum or the frontal lobe, and now those networks are starting to fire and wire together and getting better connection and communication throughout the whole brain. So when you get that communication, what you're gonna do is be able to adequately fire down into your brainstem to regulate your autonomics. So we always look at heart rate, blood pressure, lying, seated, standing. We bring people through a tilt table test because we wanna see when you come up and as you're tolerating gravity, is your heart rate going through the roof? Is your blood pressure going through the roof? Is it dropping? because these underlying autonomic dysfunctions can prevent you from moving forward with your neurological rehabilitation. So say if you have this underlying dysautonomia, you're going to have issues with your gut because of the whole brainstem, brain gut, vagal communication. So we know that we're probably gonna have to do some therapies eventually for your GI system on top of regulating your autonomics in your brainstem. And we have different therapies that we utilize to get your autonomics to function better. So lying down, seated, standing, blood pressure, bilateral, both sides, um, looking at pulse oximetry, so looking at your oxygenation perfusion, then looking at how do you tolerate gravitational load on this tilt table, and if those are off, then we're going to make note of that and take that into account as we're developing your rehab program. You might be very, very fatigable, and you might not be able to tolerate a lot of stimulation. And these are patients that are going to have chronic anxiety, fatigue, brain fog. They've done different types of therapies that are sensory-based, and they haven't gotten the results that they wanted to because they don't have the appropriate fuel delivery. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the main things that we look at with our neurological exam right off the bat. And then from there, our, our examination really doesn't look that much different than what we're taught in textbooks and what we're, what we're taught in school, really. It's just taking that into account, making really good observations, and then coming up with innovative and you know, tailored, unique protocols for that individual based off what you saw. So one of the next things that we're gonna do is do a very detailed cranial nerve examination. 
So as you know, you have a median nerve, right? So a median nerve has different sensation that would innovate your hand. And you know that, you know, that's coming out of the neck and coming down through the arm into the hand. But you also have something called cranial nerves, which come out of the brain stem. All right, there's 12 of them. And the ones that we really, really look at are cranial nerves three, four, and six. Those ones control all your eye movements. All right, all the extraocular eye muscles are controlled by that. So cranial nerves three, four, and six in their different ways help you move your eyes efficiently and get things to yoke together in appropriate ways for you to move your eyes. And the eyes are so important because eye movements always get affected with traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. You can take it to the bank. Issues with eye movements and issues with your vestibular system, issues with the cerebellum, are always gonna be affected in patients that have chronic persistent post-concussion symptoms that aren't getting better. All right, so we need to do a very detailed cranial nerve exam examination looking at, well, do you have smell? How are your visual fields? How are cranial nerves three, four, and six? What's your facial expression like? In, in my case, my facial expression was super flat. Mine too. All right, I was flat. I actually, when I was in Arizona, when I met my wife, I actually went up and talked to her twin sister first. And she looked at me and she was like, this dude's boring. <laughs> she goes, you should go talk to my sister. She still says that about you. No, yeah. <laughs> so, so I started talking to Erin and, you know, what if I would have had a good cranial nerve seven? Who knows? Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. But facial expression, you know, you see these patients and they're super flat. Their affect is flat. You know, they, they can feel the changes in their face and you know there's something going on in the circuitry of their brainstem at that point. And not only that, but your affect is controlled by your frontal lobe. You know, that frontal lobe fires down into circuits in the brainstem. So what controls your facial muscles is cranial nerve seven. That's the facial nerve. What gives you a lot of the sensation in through here, that's cranial nerve five. That's your trigeminal nerve. And that is implicated in, in headaches. So there's a lot of integration between your cervical spine and your trigeminal nerve. So your trigeminal nerve goes all throughout the brainstem and it goes down into your upper cervical cord. And there's a lot of crosstalk that's occurring between your neck and your trigeminal system. So you can palpate on somebody's neck and get different types of referral patterns up into the face and into the head. So there's a lot of crosstalk between these cranial nerves in the brainstem. And a lot of that happens because when we were developing as humans embryologically, a lot of these nerves develop right at the same time. So they communicate with each other. You know, if you think about it, it's pretty complex to be able to like, you know, move your tongue this way and move your face up this way and move eyes this way. And even doing this is super complex. And we take it for granted as humans that we can stand up, be in gravity, move our head and eyes, have them be perfectly together, not feel dizzy and have everything work out perfect. And when you hit your head, these pathways get dysfunctional. And we see it in patients that have chronic symptoms. Okay? You know, I know for me, when I first met you, you know, talking about that flat expression, I remember mm -hmm. my face was just flat. And I have a picture of me. Um, I went to an event a year apart and I had just started working with you for the second one. And yeah. the first one I'm smiling, but it's like, yeah. It's like, and the second one, I have this big that. smile. And I mean, yeah. it was just profound. It was like so cool to see that difference. Yeah. And I have pictures of myself on my passport where droopy, yep. droopy on this left side. And you know, an, an interesting fact is with my passport, just thinking about that, I would decide how I was getting better based off of how I would tolerate traveling over to Europe. Mm -hmm. So as, so I would go over there and, and do these neurology courses. And I remember the first time that I went over there, my friends and my parents were like carrying me around Amsterdam. <laughs> 
like I had a hard time just dealing with, you know, the, the pebbles on the ground and all the bikes going by. It was a complete disaster. And I would fatigue out, go hypoglycemic with my blood sugar, be like ravaging and trying to find food to stuff it in my face because my blood sugar was tanking because my brain was trying to deal with all the complexity of my visual and my vestibular world and gravity. And you take it for granted yeah. that systems just hap happen automatically. And when you injure them, stuff gets weird. Yeah. <laughs> Things get scary. So on top of that, my ability to tolerate, to go over there, jump into things, my sleep-wake cycle, my circadian rhythm, as I started getting better, trips where I would go through time zones would get easier, which is really interesting. And that's what I'll, I'll dive into that in my, my sleep talk. Mm -hmm. So back to the exam, cranial nerve examination, super important. You know, you have to look at the vestibular system, not only from like a peripheral standpoint, what's going on with the ear, because when you whiplash your neck and hit your head, you know, you could kick crystals loose. You have autoconia, you have crystals sitting on a membrane in your inner ear that can move into canals where they're not supposed to be. Therefore, when you move your head, you might perceive a moment of instability or a moment of rotation. And with traumatic brain injury, you can kick crystals loose into multiple different canals. So you could have a right horizontal canal, left anterior canal, left posterior canal, BPPV. And typically when you talk about BPPV, you know, elderly patients or people that you know, sleep with their heads back, they just go into the posterior canal. You go and you do different maneuvers and you reposition and do a little bit of a stupid rehab and people get better. But what I'm seeing with chronic, persistent post-concussion symptoms is that people have long-standing BPPV and they're in different canals and you move their head into these positions and you might not even see that their eyes are doing the nystagmus that they initially might have been doing if you would have caught it two, three years ago. So you might not have the full-blown upbeat torsional geotropic nystagmus that you might see in a posterior canal, the people might just have issues with balance, dizziness, headaches, and dysautonomia. So you have to reposition those crystals and then go into the central system that's been dysregulated for two, three years, and then start doing very specific exercises for the autonomics in combinations of head and eye movements together. And sometimes these exercises are so specific for that individual that it takes a week just to figure it out. Yeah. So people always ask, like, well, why do you see people for 15 hours in one week? Because we might have to unravel this onion all week long to, to fix this. And then next day we got to fix this. Then we got to fix that. Then we got to fix that. And we're changing your rehabilitation program from minute to minute all day long. And that's where the changes happen is when you do that much work with somebody and you're working specifically on what those issues are and you're not just giving cookie cutter rehab for them to go home because they might do that for two days and next thing you know, they need a new exercise. So that's why doing a very specific exam is, is important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was, you know, going through some of the basics of, you know, the cranial nerve examination. Um, you know, you, go, you have glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves too, and the vagus nerve is very, very important. So one of the things that we'll look at is the ability for your palate to, to raise appropriately. Have you seen me do that on, on anybody? Do you remember I me? I think that? so. Yeah, so you can look at the palate, and it's supposed to be like a catcher's mitt. It raises up. It's innervated by the vagus nerve and glossopharyngeal and other patterns, but you can see this just hanging down in some individuals. And if that's the case, there might be changes in the brainstem and changes in oxygenation and changes in gut function. So that's why, you know, we're doing tongue stimulation, we're having people gargle, we're doing non-invasive, you know, cranial laser vagal stimulation. We do different types of electrical stim to stimulate the vagus nerve and different types of combinations of head and eye movements to activate those circuits in the brain. 
to fire down into the projections to the gut. But then we're also doing therapies to the gut when people are in like non-invasive laser over the stomach, electric stimulation with different types of direct current over the ileocecal valve and the gut to try and get things propulsing and moving. You know, sometimes we're doing different types of, you know, manual manipulation, visceral manipulation to get that feedback to try and integrate that axis together. So that's, that's the vagus nerve. Um, and then you have the spinal accessory nerve. There's this integration between the head and the neck and the eyes and these SCM and trap muscles, which are super important. Which are my but, problem. <laughs> yeah. So take it to the bank. If you're tight all the time in your neck and in your traps, it's probably there for a reason. If you get manual therapy and you know PT and chiropractic and massage and whatever, and it comes back, it's because it's being maintained by your brain's inability to know where you are in space. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're going to develop different types of posturing of your body and head positioning to try and get all of your systems to make sense of where you are so you can autonomically know where to push blood in appropriate ways to allow you to know where you are in space. You know, when I, so one of the first therapies I actually did get at like 15, 18 months was cranial sacral therapy. Yeah. And I had a pretty significant head tip. And I remember him commenting on that. And he's like, I'm not quite sure why you still have a head tip. Um, Cause he said that particular part of my neck felt loose, you mm -hmm. know, and then to find out after meeting you, the head tip was sort of a coping mechanism for my eyes. Not, yeah. not knowing where they are. Yeah, I mean, so you had essentially maintained the stibular dysfunction in a skew deviation where one eye basically looked like it was higher than the other in the globe. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't specifically from eye muscles. It was based off of the vestibular system. And we did very specific different, you know, movements and different ways of activating muscles in the eyes to get them to basically torsion the right way. And then your head just went right back up to center. <laughs> and then you felt like you weren't on the boat anymore. Yes. Yeah. So it's no longer floating and, and yeah, floating. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't really spinning. Yeah. I was more floating and rocking all the time. And we did that in three days. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. If you get very specific with your exam, you can figure out what these issues are and do targeted treatments. And in my mind, you should see changes in people in three days if you can help them, if you can make changes to their system, if they have the ability to build neuroplasticity and change function, you should be able to do the right thing and do that exercise and make changes in people in a week. All right, they're not gonna be fixed in that week because there's this whole other right. underlying aspect of stuff that's going on with autoimmunity or neuroautoimmunity or gut dysfunction or inflammation or chronic infections, anxiety, depression, but you should see improvement of symptoms in a week if you're doing the right stuff. Mm -hmm. That's my idea. Okay. So, so that was the, that was the cranial nerve examination that was going into some of the, some of the visual stuff and vestibular. <clears throat> it's very, very important from a visual standpoint to realize that vision is so much more than visual acuity. Yes. All right. And we've had multiple amazing presenters on here in the neuro optometric world. And we have another one this year, Dr. Bieberdorf, who is going to talk about that. And with the visual system, it uses all areas of the brain, right? So when we look at one type of eye movement versus another type of eye movement, there's different areas centrally in the brain that are being used more or less. So say, for example, if you're looking at gaze stability, like your, your ability to keep your eyes steady on a target, that is using one area of the brain more so than potentially if you're doing a pursuit eye movement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we look at these different eye movements, we extrapolate the information, we link it back to the areas of the brain centrally that might be dysfunctional, and then we start activating those areas of the brain to get them to work better. 
So say if you had a pursuit eye movement that was dysfunctional, you can't follow the target, and you've done vision therapy, and you're trying, people are trying to get you to pursue, and you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you, you develop more dysautonomia and headaches, and you feel horrible, and you feel worse, we can come up with strategies to activate those areas of the brain first to get them to integrate, and then your visual exercise might work better. So people ask us that all the time. Well, I've done vision therapy. You do eye exercises. What makes them different? We're trying to localize the areas neurologically that are off, and we're priming them. We're, we're like going, hey, Pradalo, what's up? You know, here's a hand movement. You know, we're stimulating your wrist. We're stimulating your ankle. We're moving your shoulder. We might be stimulating the tongue, doing different types of sensory modalities to activate that brain, to prime it up, to get it going. And then we go in there and we do the exercise. So it's, it's about integrating these different sensory systems together usually. It's not that stuff is broken. It's that things aren't integrating together the way that they should. Right. Does that kind of make sense? So yeah. from an eye movement standpoint, we need to look at can you keep your eyes steady? Can you follow targets smoothly? Can you follow targets smoothly with your head and eyes together? Can you move your head one way and follow something smooth the other way? Can you do that in all different directions? Can you move your eyes quickly and hit the targets with your eyes and not stop short or go too far past the target? Can you look at a target and then move your head and see if you can keep your eyes steady on it? Can we move objects in front of you and have you be able to have the appropriate eye movement and not feel dizzy and nauseous and feel like you're spinning. And then we start to do movement with people and have them move and have people move in front of them and see if they can tolerate it. So we try and make things a little bit more real life situation. And now clinically with adding in the virtualis, I can put you in all these situations and try and find where you might develop your symptoms. So you might be and here's an example. I had like four or five people this last week where they had all these visual-based symptoms and we do our eye testing and we look at their VNG and their saccadometer and their right eye testing and everything for the most part actually looks pretty normal. But when you do the bedside exam and they have to look at me and look at something behind me and they have to deal with the depth perception and the complexity of the real world, they're super symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And then I put them in my virtual reality and find that, oh my gosh, like you, there's no way that you can deal with something moving on this side of you right now. And we pull these things out and then we start developing very specific rehab and putting people in real life situations as we work them up through the week. So we've looked at autonomics. You know, we've looked at posture and cranial nerve examination. We looked at a, a visual examination. And other people during the summit are going to break these down even more in depth. Like Dr. Sass is really going to go through the autonomics. Bieberdorf's really going to go through eye movements. Mm -hmm. Dr. Reese is really going to go through headaches. So I'm not going to go too in depth in these. It's kind of more of an overview. So those are what we've looked at. But then we have to look at, well, how do people move? Mm -hmm. And we have to do a very good gait analysis and watch people walk forward and backward, watch them walk from the side, have them, here's an important one, have them dual task and walk. So have them walk and say every other month, every other letter of the alphabet, things of, of that. And what you'll see is people will completely break down when they have to dual task, yeah. or they might get better, which is good. So if I see people's gait patterns get better as they're thinking and dual tasking, that means that their frontal lobe is working pretty well and we're most likely going to be able to jump in and really start rehabbing them sooner and not have to do so many things just to get their autonomic stable to try and just make sure they have blood flow to their head. I remember for me, you had me walk and I think, I think I was shuffling or something. I, I remember I wasn't walking correctly and mm -hmm. you had to literally reteach me like I had to go through those, that motion of walking, 
like yeah. just standing there. Yeah. I had no idea I wasn't walking normally. I thought I was walking normally. And then when you had me go through those motions, like it was really hard to get my body to walk normally yeah. again. It was crazy. In some patients, we can't even we can't even do that type of gait rehab that we did with you. We might just have to electrically stimulate the patterns in their legs and in their arms to get that feedback centrally before they can even go in and like move their arms and legs themselves. So that's that whole like sensory motor yeah. aspect where some people can't do these motor movements with their body yet because they have no clue where they are and they don't know where to push the blood to. So we might have to activate their parietal lobe and their sensory and then go in there and do some very specific eye movements first before they can even move. One of the things people don't realize is that when you walk and you have a heel strike, I mean, there's, there's movement of your head. Yeah. So as your heel hits the ground, that force goes up through your body. Your head has to move. And it's not just going like this. It's going left and right. You're going like this. There's a little bit of roll that's in there. And if you have essentially maintained vestibular disorder, you're going to get symptoms when you just walk. And is, a lot that why, is that why I was shuffling? Yeah. Like I just naturally kind of went into a shuffle to compensate? You're going to see people shuffling, even, they, even though they don't have Parkinson's disease. You're going to mm -hmm. see people take shorter strides. You're going to see a wide base gait potentially. You could see people, you know, they're walking with their friend at the mall and they're like, why does Jeremy always bump into me? Why is he holding on? That was me. Yeah, that was me too. <laughs> Um, you know, you'll see decreased arm swing. You'll see people walk, but they'll have like a hand that's out. It's called the cantilever response to try and balance themselves out. You'll see all sorts of different patterns of body movement with gait dysfunction that's related to changes that are occurring in the central vestibular system. So looking at gait is very important. Um, just looking at reflexes, so, you know, muscle strength, all the sensory, you need to know where stuff is to be able to move it. So you need to check pinwheel vibration. Um, can people tolerate different weights in their hands? Do they know if something's heavy? Do they know if something's light? You go in and you touch different fingers and tell me which finger that I'm touching. Uh, move a finger up or down. See if they know if you're moving their fingers up or down. Some people won't know which fingers you're touching or which toes that you're touching, and that's a problem. So you need to have that sensory aspect there before you can really jump in and start moving into the motor aspect. So that's why I think we make a lot of very amazing changes in gait and balance and posture because we don't just do gait rehab. So we're not just putting you in a harness and having you work on your gait. We're working on all the aspects of knowing where you are in space first before we integrate with the motor system. All right, another big player is, it's really, it's looking at reflexes. So with, uh, with brain injury, you're gonna have different patterns of reflexes and we're always looking at, hey, is there a lower motor neuron issue or upper motor neuron? When you injure the brain and you know, how the brain fires down, if there's trauma centrally, you could have hyperreflexia. So you hit reflexes and they're gonna be very, very increased. So we see that. Sometimes we don't see that and reflexes are very weak. And that could be an issue too. So the muscles could be hypotonic. All right, another issue that we could see is where we go and we hit reflexes. Say if we like hit a bicep reflex, your bicep might contract, but then your head might go, or wow. you hit your arm and your arm goes in the opposite direction. So reflexes sometimes centrally can be not integrated appropriately, and that can affect your mapping of where you are. I can't tell you how many times I'll hit like a, a knee or patellar reflex and see somebody's arm go on the opposite side of their body. With, you know, and people are going, wait, what? I thought a reflex was just, you hit it and it goes into the spinal cord and it comes right back out. I think there's more to the story than that, mm -hmm. right? There's integration of all those, those neurons in the cord, but they're being integrated from the brain in different networks and different motor networks, how they fire down to regulate that. And these reflexes are very important. So say if we're hanging out and 
we're walking out on the icy road right now and you slip, you should have the appropriate patterns of your arms going out, your legs going out to basically catch you from falling. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yep. In your case, you were holding on to Pixie, therefore you didn't have the appropriate, re what are you gonna do, throw your dog in the air? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't break my fall at all. Yeah. Except my head. <laughs> yep. So, you know, we look at motor, we look at sensory, we look at reflexes, very important. And then a very detailed cerebellar examination. So the cerebellum is basically, it's kind of back here. And what it does is integrate your ability to rapidly, you know, move your hands back and forth. Um, same thing with the legs. Not only is it involved with that, but it integrates into your vestibular system and how your eyes track appropriately. And it helps basically get all those systems to, to work together efficiently. So if you injure your cerebellum, you can have changes in your eye movements. You could have changes in your vestibular function, how it's gating those systems. You could have changes in your gait. You could have changes in your balance. And not only that, this cerebellum is more than just that. It's integrated with your emotions. Mm. So you can have cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome where your cerebellum's not working and now you're not connecting all your thoughts in the appropriate way. Right. All right. Which sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So the cerebellum is super important. We have to look at finger to nose, look for uh, DDK, which is your inability to rapidly move your hands like this in the appropriate way. And you'll see people start, you know, doing different things like this. They'll come in instead of being perfectly here. You might see that. All right. If, it, if your cerebellum is really affected, you might see something like that. All right. You move the eyes quickly. You'll look over here. You might overshoot or undershoot the target. You move your head and eyes together with the cerebellum not integrating those systems. And if you go this way, you might get super dizzy. All right, even though your inner ear and the central vestibular system, everything's working, the cerebellum still has to communicate with all those different pathways to get it to integrate appropriately. So doing the cerebellar examination is very important. And then from there, you know, we really do a super detailed structural examination of what's going on with all your muscle patterns, uh, different patterns in the cervical spine and how it might be referring up into the head. You know, I examine the scalp. I, I can't tell you how many times like I've found, you know, areas in the back of the head where you palpate on that and it recreates people's pain. So people can have peripheral mechanisms, meaning it's coming from something structurally that's leading to your symptoms, or it could be coming from central issues too. So we have to look at both. Mm -hmm. That kind of makes sense? Yeah. So you could have both of them going on at the same time. You could have an issue with your eye tracking, how you move your eyes and now your neck's really tight and now you have this maintained position. So you go up and you palpate here and next thing you know, it's whipping into boom, 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 occipital patterns. And you need to, maybe you need to treat this first to get some sort of pain decreased. Otherwise you go in there and do any of your eye head exercises and you just generate more pain. So I think that might've been key with you, which was, getting your eyes to torsion the way that they were supposed to, getting them to be steady, and then treating your cervical spine and getting that pain to decrease and getting the appropriate movement to allow us to go in there to do more combinations of head and eye exercises and not flare you know, your occipital nerve and your herbs point. There's different spots in the neck. Like one of them here is herbs point. that gives you pain that might come up in different distributions. So you have to do, do your chiropractic or physical therapy or whatever technique that you do, whatever practitioner that you are, do your examination very detailed of the cervical spine and know that there can be issues in the upper cervical spine in this structure that are preventing your patient from getting better. And not only just pain, there's a lot of feedback from the neck that fires into all these circuits that I'm talking about. So the cervical spinal feedback from joint mechanoreceptors and muscle spindles and GTOs fires into the cerebellum 
cerebellum integrates. Oh, hey, that's where my neck is. Cerebellum is talking to your eyes and your vestibular system. So when you go and move your head and eyes together, everything works perfect. So your neck kind of binds all this information together and you have gravitational load and that's getting feedback from your muscles, talking to your cerebellum, talking to your eyes to let you know where you are in space. All right, so super, super important to do a very detailed structural examination. You know, and, and I, think, I think the future of concussion rehabilitation, honestly, I just think there's gonna be a whole new, prof new profession that's developed where it doesn't really matter what type of provider that you are, whether you're a DC or a PT or a DO or an MD, that everybody is on the same page with what's going on from a neurological standpoint. Yeah. And we put it all together to design novel, innovative, specific rehab programs for each individual to get them better. Mm -hmm. So that would be my hopes for the future. And just all of us being on the same page and understanding, you know, what's going on with all these circuits. And to be honest, I think that, that what we're doing with the summit is helping. Mm -hmm. And there's other people doing summits. I think everybody's starting to get on the same page. Yeah. From, from looking at all the research that's out there and you know I'm pulling all this research together and I'm writing a book so that's that's going to be my next thing is putting this all together and writing a book that integrates you know this for not only practitioners but patients I'm super excited about that yeah yeah <laughs> so that's you know that's kind of the basics of the neurological examination I went through a ton of stuff so I don't know if you want to, you know, throw some other ideas out right now. You know, I think it's just really important for people listening, you know, like for me, I had a lot of pain. I, you know, yeah. I, I'm very in tune with my body. I knew that my neck pain was causing my headaches. I knew something was wrong with my eyes. I thought the right side of my body was weak, but in reality, it turned out it was the left side of my body. Like I knew there was all these things going on with me, but mm -hmm. I didn't know they were all related to the, the brain injury. And yeah. I think a lot of people listening now might resonate with that too. Like I have a good friend. She has all of this pain going on, like in her clavicle region, which is then pulling up through here. And that's what's causing her massive headaches. But mm -hmm. her neurologist is telling her, you know, that, her headaches are migraines and they give her migraine meds, which do nothing because it's not a migraine, right? So I think it's finding a doctor like you who truly can look at that whole system and put it together. Yeah. I think that's such a key. I know that was my, you know, that was the missing link in my recovery. Totally. But yeah. And, you know, in the functional neurology world, you know, we're doing that and from what I'm researching, I think more people are getting on that path. And in the future, you're going to be able to go to all these amazing clinics around the world, around the country that are thinking this way. It might take some time, but I know that everybody's going to get there eventually. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, and, and in terms of you know, my recovery, when I look back, you know, I was doing all the intensive care and, you know, I, I did the intensive a couple of times. I was doing intensive care, a, you know, I probably did about two or three throughout a year where I needed to do different rotations and different things. So it just, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't just wake up and boom, you're just fixed like that. It's definitely a process and, you know, you got to be patient and sometimes it's hard to be patient. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're angry and then sometimes you're too hard on yourself, not only on yourself, but you're also hard on the people that are trying to help you. <laughs> yeah. So take it easy on the people that are trying to help you. And because they might not, they honestly, they just don't know what you're going through because they've never had brain injury most likely. So when they say things like, you know, once you do this, once you get up and do that, and you're like, there's no way in heck I can do that because I have so much fatigue. You just got to realize that they have no clue what you're going through 
And that's why what you do is so important because the information that you get out to caregivers, you know, probably flips their paradigm and they start to understand like, holy crap, like she can't, my daughter can't even look in one direction. How is she supposed to take the garbage out? Right. You know, so everybody needs to keep moving forward. Be nice to yourself. Be nice to the people that are trying to help you, even though it might be hard sometimes. <laughs> be nice to your practitioners. You know, even the people that the therapies that they're doing might not seem to be like they're, might not seem like they're helping. Obviously, the people care about you and they're trying to get you better. All right. And that's why I think with doing the summit, it's so important because we're educating everybody, patients, caregivers, other providers, that there is things that can be done and that there's hope for getting people better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's why we started this. This is our third one. And, you know, every year we get more and more people watching it um, who have profound aha moments and we have providers watching it that have aha moments mm -hmm. and um, that's why I do all my advocacy work you know just because if you can touch just one person with it you've made a difference oh totally and that's you know that's why you know at our office we're in a continual state of evolution with our practice where now I have three other amazing providers that that work for me and they do amazing work with everybody that comes in during the week. I love being in the office. I love working with everybody and I'm oversighting everything. And these, these providers like Dr. Reese and Dr. Cass and Dr. S all their names like rhyme together. Dr. Sass <laughs> are super amazing getting patients better. And there are trained, you know, chiropractors and functional neurologists all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we have those resources to, you know, get you in touch with these people and they're on your site and we can, you know, maybe even put something together and get that out to people. We just want to help people. Yeah. So. Well, all right. Awesome. This has been great information. Um, you know, I think this was a great way to kick off our summit this year. And I just, I look forward to this summit and hearing from people how um, their aha moments affect them. Mm -hmm. so thanks Jeremy yeah, and thank you. thank you everyone and we'll see you in the next episode